Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. here from University College London. It's going to talk about deterministic approximate inference in learning and planning. And in order for him not to embarrass himself advertising his own book, I will now do this for Thank you. <laughs> David is in the, or has completed at least his part of the deal with Cambridge University Press on uh, producing an excellent uh, textbook on Bayesian reasoning and machine learning. And uh, it's hopefully coming out in October. So, uh, it's already online, isn't it? It's online, it's yeah. Online, right? yeah. 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 Don't need to buy it. <laughs> just, waiting, just waiting for the publisher to sell yes. it up. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid there's some truth in that. All yeah. right. Thank okay, you. thanks, Toro. So um, I'm going to attempt to speak about two uh, quite separate topics, actually. I know, I know this is probably sort of violating the first rule of uh, how to give a talk, but uh, uh, let's see how it goes. We may run out of time, but... Um, so the first um, topic is going to be about learning in uh, Bayesian linear models. So I'm going to try to relate local and variational Gaussian KL style variational uh, procedures. Um, and this is work that's just been uh, published in AI Stats this year with Ed Chalice, my student. And then the second part is going to be about using Lagrange duality for solving uh, finite horizon stationary Markov decision processes. And that came out also this year. And that's with my student, Tom Firmston. So um, the, there's going to be very few technical details, actually, in today's talk. So please um, read these papers. They're all available online. Um, if you've got any tough technical questions, uh, you might be better just uh, reading the paper than hoping to get a great response from me today. But I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, so let's start with the, the first topic. So I think most of you are very familiar with uh, Bayesian linear models, and this is going to sound in some sense a, a very old, uh, perhaps a well-studied story, but um, I think there are still some interesting things to discuss here. So of course, Bayesian linear models are, are heavily used in machine learning statistics and a, a variety of other fields, of course. Famous examples of true skill, exactly, and things like collaborative filtering. And uh, but the problem with this, whilst it's a great model, is that the posterior distribution we get is typically non-Gaussian. So we need to do some kind of approximate inference there, maybe EP variational sampling, something like that. Now, for this talk, I'm particularly interested in a special class of variational methods which give me a lower bound on the the marginal likelihood, the partition function, okay? And the reason for that is that they're particularly useful then if you want to do hyperparameter learning because you can then increase the low bound with respect to the parameters. So the, the story is basically going to be how that we go, we're going to relate these local and variational Gaussian likelihood bounds. Um, and what we're going to try to show, actually, is that, in fact, the variational Gaussian bound is tighter than the local bounds. So these local bounds have been kind of more popular the last 10 years or so. In fact, uh, they are suboptimal. The version of the bound is, is uniformly superior in some sense. And indeed, furthermore, not only that, but the version of the Gaussian bound is actually concave. In, uh, in fact, it's a function of the parameters of the bound. And even more so, you can actually implement it cheaply. So in a sense, I'm kind of I'm coming down heavily against the use of local uh, bounding methods. OK, so this usual story, I'm interested in the posterior distribution, some weights, W given some data D. And that's typically of the former some kind of likelihood term times by prior term. And the marginal likelihood here the, is in the denominator. And I'm also going to call that Z, partly because in some models, this may not necessarily correspond to P or D, but we may still be interested in the normalization constant or the partition function Z. And what I mean by a linear model is that the posterior distribution is going to have this kind of form. There'll be some Gaussian term, and there'll be some product over sites N of some non-Gaussian term. Then linearity refers to this projection here for some constant vectors H. So this kind of model, of course, 
is familiar to you if you put, say, a Gaussian prior and you have some, say, non-Gaussian likelihood term and it's IID, you would get that kind of structure. And Z then would be the, the normalization constant and we're going to assume that this, this high dimensional integral is going to be um, transform. So just to be concrete, for example, you could have, say, two classes, plus one, minus one, logistic sigmoid, the probability of being class one is just the logistic sigmoid of the, of the overlap between W and X. And then you could do a Bayesian thing where you say, well, actually put a prior distribution, which is a Gaussian on the weights. I've got IID data, and this gives me a posterior distribution, which is basically of this form, then a prior Gaussian prior, and these are your uh, likelihood terms, okay? And we want to then approximate in some way this, but we're particularly interested in a normalization approximation. approximation. So, um, yeah, this is the, the, just a simple picture, two classes here. Um, our prior belief is that we want the weights to be small, perhaps there's a Gaussian distribution here. The likelihood terms are preferring weights over here. The weights are basically orthogonal to the decision boundary here. And then the combination of these two gives us this posterior distribution. So this is the most likely weight, sort of this direction. But these kind of weights are also pretty good, which you'd expect from here, because the, any decision boundary in here would also be OK. OK, so getting slightly more technical, the, I'm going to just give you an overview of the two sort of generic classes that at least I'm aware of for bounding this Z term. So one is called uh, the local bound. So if you think about a, a general problem, you want to have a Z of this form products over sort of local side functions, F, N, and these, each of these F, Ns are non-negative, non then I want to lower bound this in some way. So one way to do that is to say, well, look, maybe I can lower bound each of these terms, these site functions, by some simpler function, say GN. So it will turn out that typically we choose something like a Gaussian for that, OK? And these uh, psi N parameters are going to be used later on to help us to tighten this lower bound. And because these are non-negative, then basically we can take a product of them and still get a, a, a bound. And we can sum them up and we still get a bound. So in other words, we can then bound, lower bound Z by some integrated um, local bounds here to get a new bound as a function of now a vector of site parameters. Okay. And then the idea is that later on we will adjust these, uh, these variational parameters to tighten the bound. So this has been an idea that's been around a long time. So I was first aware of this from Mark Girolami, but people like Tommy Ackler, Mike Jordan, many other people, Matthias Zeg has been heavily working on this the last five years or so. But these have been applied a lot in places like uh, image reconstruction, etc. Now, an another way to do, to get a low bound is actually a kind of very classical idea. Um, Partly done, I guess, maybe one of the first ones in machine learning was myself and Chris Bishop. But there have been other kinds of people, because Tommy Yackler, Mike Jordan, tons of people have been looking at this as well many years ago. And more recently, some other people have been looking at this as well. Now, the idea is that it's really simple. You just say, well, look, you know, I've got a posterior distribution of this form. If I take the KL divergence between some variational distribution Q and this posterior distribution, the non-negativity of this gives me immediately a lower bound on the log likelihood, uh, the marginal likelihood. So in other words, it breaks down into an entropic term and what's called an energy term here. And this just follows immediately from, from that. So the idea is that provided that the entropy and the energy are both tractably computable, then you also have a lower bound. And we're going to choose a class of distributions for which that will hold. So the obvious thing to do is then choose a Gaussian distribution because the entropy of Gaussian is easy. And provided that we're, we're careful with uh, what this function fn looks like, well, hopefully we'll be able to compute that energy term as well. OK, so we've, give, we've got then two generic procedures. And the interesting thing is, particularly if you're choosing a Gaussian distribution for this local site bound here, and a Gaussian for this q, you've got Gaussians everywhere. And you think, well, crikey, there must be some kind of relationship between these methods. And this is what we want to try to understand. OK, so um, the, um, I'm doing slightly more specific. Each of these uh, local site functions now, when we take the product of them, will give us some combined lower bound as a function of w and some other variation of parameters. I'm just going to write that that is then, if we take Gaussian site bounding functions g, small g, 
that's going to give us some kind of quadratic form in W as the lower bound, okay? And this function C, this matrix F, and this vector F, they're functions of these variational parameters. I'm not going to specify what they are, but they, there are well-known functions which can bound specific site functions uh, of that structure, okay? So for example, just to give you an intuition for this, if you've got this logistic sigmoid function here, it's quite clear that you can lower bound that with a kind of a squared exponential or Gaussian style function. And similarly, if you've got a super Gaussian distribution here, it's quite clear that you can, you can lower bound that as well. So um, once you've done that, you've got some particular lower bound, and these, these functions C, F, and F will depend upon actually what these uh, site functions are, these red functions, okay? And then when we've done that, we've got uh, an integral to carry out some Gaussian times by some kind of Gaussian function here. We can do that integral. We get then some bound as a function of psi, and we will then optimize that with respect to psi. So this is the local method that's been very popular recently. The very short Gaussian one says, OK, the Q is of this form. So with some mean covariance matrix, to plug that in. The entropy of the, covariance of the Gaussian is just the log determinant of the covariance matrix. We've got some log quadratic form here to compute. That's very easy with respect to a Gaussian. And then we've got some term here to compute. So this is, these two come from the prior, if you like, on PW. This is our log um, site term here. Now, this is also typically easy to do because whilst this is a high dimensional integral, actually it really is only one dimensional integral because this function only depends upon one scalar, which is the overlap between W and H. So if W is Gaussian distributed, H is fixed, this means that this one-dimensional projection is also Gaussian distributed. So in fact, this is just a one-dimensional integral. So you can compute this for any function phi, provided it's not sort of pathologically complex in some sense. You can just do that by numerical integration. And then you will end up with a, so the idea will be then you've got some non-Gaussian distribution, this red one here, and you fit a, a Gaussian distribution by then adjusting the mean and the covariance matrix to to maximize this right-hand side here. Okay, so this is um, kind of interesting already. You see that actually, in principle, this variation of Gaussian bound is actually more generally applicable than the local method because it holds for all site functions, fine, whereas the local method only holds for those ones for which there exists a lower bound on the in in each individual site function. So what is known about the relationship between these two kind of classes of procedure? So we know that the local method is, is, uh, is more restrictive in its, uh, its application. What's really interesting about the local method, and I think one of the main reasons for its popularity, is actually you can show, uh, Matthias Seger showed, that it's actually convex in psi. So this is a really nice property because it means that it's, uh, you can do the optimizations with some uh, confidence that you'll get a good, uh, a good result. And actually what you can also show is that the, Matthias, for example, has come up with very nice scalable optimization procedures. So these are uh, very fast, uh, using some kind of Lanxos codes, which exploit some clever properties, which uh, show that actually you can get the right answer uh, quite cheaply. One thing that's not great about the local method, though, is actually it, the bound itself is not uh, scalable in the sense that you cannot compute the bound, or there's no known procedure which can tractably compute the bound itself. So it sounds a bit strange. You can, you can actually optimize the bound in a tractable way, but you cannot actually say what the value of the bound is in a tractable sense. And when I mean tractable, I mean something which scales in time which is less than cubic in the dimension of W. Okay. And before our work, I think not really was no, not a lot was known about the VG method. Some things were known. But what we're going to show is that, in fact, it's concave in M and S. It's scalable. The bound is also always scalable and the bound is actually tighter than the local bound. So I'm not going to go through the, the proof, but uh, the, the way this works is that we write down, the, this is the bound, the entropy and the energy terms are coming in here. This is the, the KL version of Gaussian bound. And then the idea is that if you choose, say, some particular <coughs> class of site functions for which the local method is actually applicable, you can then bound just this term here by that some local site function. And again, because this is typically uh, simple to do, well, sorry, just let me say this. So 
This actually then is going to give a, a kind of a weakened form of the variational Gaussian bound because we're exploiting this fact that the each site function can be bounded as well. And this gives us a B tilde, a weakened KL bound, essentially, or variational Gaussian bound, as a function of the mean covariance matrix and the, and the variational parameters of the local bounding function. And what you can show, if you, read, if you read the paper, you'll see this, is that if you fix uh, psi and you, you then look at the, at the, the change in the, the bound, this, this weakened bound here, uh, with respect to M and S, the optimal M and S, which gives this, this point here, the, the best bound, at that setting, actually the bound, this weakened bound, is actually equal to the local variational bound. Okay, so this gives you a connection between these two approaches. And because of this simple relationship here, you know immediately that because this is a weakened form of KL bound, if you plug that M uh, psi and S psi into this bound, you immediately get a better bound for the KL procedure. Okay? And furthermore, you can actually, there's no need to use that particular M psi and S psi. You can actually optimize further and get an even better bound by fully optimizing with respect to M and S. So this is a kind of nice story uh, in the sense that, you know, maybe in principle you can get a better bound. Of course, what we need to do is to show actually that it's possible to get tractably, uh, in computational tractable amount of time, to get a good M and get a good S. So that's what we also need to think about. So one thing that we're particularly keen on then is what is the structure, the geometric structure of this, uh, this KL bound, you know. So people have showed that the the variational local bound is actually concave, so that's, that's good. But what about this variational Gaussian? So I think other people have looked at this before, and it looks kind of straightforward, but the, you hit a problem. So um, if you look at the, the structure of this, uh, this bound, we've got this entropy term, and that's clearly concave. That's well known to be concave with respect to the parameterization of the covariance matrix. I'm going to, I should say that I'm going to use a Cholesky style parameterization for the covariance matrix. So this will, this will just be some kind of log debt C term. So that's clearly concave. This term here is just some kind of quadratic function, which is clearly concave. That's no problem. And then you're left with this sort of side functions here. And what, what's going on with that? That's so your, all of the effort is really to try to understand the concavity of that term. So like I said before, if you just re-transform this into a one-dimensional average, you can write that in this way, where this mean and this, this sigma are defined in this way here. And then you can examine, for example, what is the property of this log phi as I move m and c, as I vary them. Is it concave? And the answer is no. Okay, so this function here actually is not concave as a function of m and c. This is a problem. So this is really where you, you kind of hit the buffers doing any totally naive kind of argumentation because um, the, the classical thing you would do is say, well, look, you know, each function here is, is concave and then it's just, you know, adding up concave functions, therefore that thing is concave. That would be the easy proof, but it's not the case. But what you can show is actually uh, that the average, after you've integrated or summed up these non-concave functions, that actually the result is concave. Okay, so it's a slightly more complex argument, and that's what we prove in the paper. Okay, so I have to say the proof that we, we had is a little bit uh, brute force and not very not very elegant, but Mercatus Titius provided us a, a much nicer, elegant proof, um, and you can get that from the supplementary material if you're interested. Okay, so things are looking good in the sense that we've shown now that the, actually the variational Gaussian is tighter than the local Gaussian, uh, the local method, and in fact that it's also concave. But we still need to kind of actually show that there are ways of getting the optimal M and the optimal S without doing some kind of sort of cubic operations. So this is, um, this is not necessarily so easy. So if you think about using a full Cholesky uh, sort of decomposition for your covariance matrix, the complexity of computing the bound is going to scale linearly with the number of data points, and it's going to be quadratic in the number of dimensions of W. Now, this is maybe fine if you've got a relatively small problem. Indeed, many problems are of that form. But there are certainly things that, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, maybe TrueSkill is an example where you'd have 
many hundreds of thousand dimensions d, maybe even more. So, you know, any kind of you know cubic or certainly quadratic style uh, complexity here is a is a killer. Basically, you really don't want that. So that's not really going to to work. So a simpler thing you can do is to use what we call a chevron Cholesky decomposition, which is of this structure here. And of course now you're you're losing some expressibility with computational complexity for this width k here reduces to order n dk. So as long as you choose something relatively small here, then things are going to be kind of linear in the dimension. So hopefully that's good enough. So um, just to, to give you a flavor as to you know, that this isn't, isn't just a pipe dream, here's uh, one example classification problem. This is logistic regression. It's called RealSim. And there are 36,000 training points about 20,000 input dimensions, so it's quite a big problem. Although it's sparse, there are many, many of these, um, these input vectors are zero, apart from a few of them, so 0.5% of them are only non-zero. And if we look now at the various methods here, so this is the variational Gaussian method using a diagonal covariance, and we can compute the bound. It takes about three minutes for us uh, to, to run, and we get a pretty good uh, test accuracy as well. This is the variation of Gaussian with uh, the chevron complexity using a width of uh, 100. Get a slightly better bound, takes a bit longer, but it's also pretty, pretty good. The local method, actually, um, we cannot compute the bound at all. Okay, it's totally intractable. Okay? But what you can do is you can attempt to run the procedure with some kind of um, reduced rank Lanxos codes. And but the problem with that is that the bound it, that that produces, the approximate bound, is actually so far away from the truth that it's not usable. So we cannot report that even. Um, and that takes actually longer than our methods and gives but about a similar performance. Okay, so uh, we've also applied this to several other problems and we find similar results. So in other words, the take home message here is that even though we're using very restricted covariance forms, actually we can still get pretty good results, and, so, and, it's, and it's scalable. Another area that you might be interested in is using these kind of methods for, say, uh, inverse modeling, where you might have some, some sort of um, states of your, your world or your uh, internal states, and you've got some observations, and you might have a linear relationship between your observations and these internal states for some given matrix M and maybe some Gaussian noise E term. And then under some kind of non-Gaussian priors here, some sparsity priors, for example, some kind of Laplace-style distribution, you'd like to compute the marginal likelihood. So this is again a, a, of the form before. This is our Gaussian-style distribution here. We've got some kind of uh, phi w's which are coming from this term here. And then we want to integrate that to compute the marginal likelihood. And this is difficult again, but we can uh, use uh, our method and the local method to approximately compute this thing as a function of tau. And actually what we're going to do just for this uh, experiment is, is choose the problem to be small enough that I can actually compute everything pretty much exactly, okay, just to compare. We could apply this to very, very big systems, but we wouldn't be able to compare the bound from the local method in that case. And these are the kinds of uh, things that you get, and I'm going to plot this as a function of tau now. So this is a very simple kind of hyperparameter model selection problem. I want to find the best tau which maximizes p of y given tau. Sorry, what was full again? Uh, what's k, what's d? d is, um, this is 100 and this is 200 in this case. So n, d is going to be 200 and n is going to be one in this example. This is one training point. It's not such an interesting example, but it's just a demonstration. So 200 dimensions here, uh, 100 here. That doesn't really matter very much. It's the dimensionality of this that counts. And there's just going to be one training point. So n is now playing the role of, the, of these site indicators here. OK, so um, if you look at using the variational Gaussian in the full case, so that, like I said, this is so small that we can actually do everything exactly. As a function of tau, you know, the best tau is given by some value down here. We can also run the variation of Gaussian for some reduced rank sort of uh, Chevron style, not reduced rank, but a reduced complexity um, parameterization. 
get another band here. This one here, this black line, is actually, this is the, f this is the exact local method, okay? There's no approximation. See, this can, it's the system's small enough that we can actually do that. Typically, you would not be able to do that. Um, and this one here is a sort of a reduced rank Lanxos style approximation to the local method. So you see there's, you know, there's a big gap here. And what's also interesting is the qualitative you know, and quantitative location of the optimal tau is ra really rather different for the different bounds. OK. Can I see the model again? The yeah. So you're saying that the thing you're solving for is tau in this model. That's right, yeah. Well, so what's happening with w? W, I'm integrating over it. So is it a Q over W and tau factorized? Or? No, it's just um, it's, it's Q of W given tau. So um, there's no, okay. it's just flat maximum likelihood over tau. So I'm just computing P of. Given, yeah, so uh, everything is given except, so M is given, S is given, and uh, that's it, actually. And we integrate over w. And then I'm going to optimize that as a function of tau. So this kind of setup corresponds to something like you might have in, say, MRI, where you know what this sort of the, the transmission matrix is of your, of your system. You know, you've got some kind of complex and the electromagnetic system there. And that, that's encoded in this sort of this transformation matrix M. Maybe you also have a good idea of what the kind of noise level is of your, of your system. but you know, it's as though it's a little bit analogous to something like an MRI scanner problem. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's um, that's you know quite an, an interesting story. And like I said, typically though, this you should bear in mind that you would never be able to get this picture typically from the local method. It's just not possible. It's only this special case. So the summary for from this part of the talk is that actually the VG methods are are tighter than the local methods. Um, that they're actually scalable and it's concave and it's actually very straightforward to implement this. All you need to do is just have some one-dimensional numerical integration procedure to compute your average of your log site functions and then you can plug that into a standard off-the-shelf optimizer. So this is much, much simpler than the, the kinds of uh, procedures which have been advocated for the local method. Marcus, you look like you want to ask a question. Uh, yeah, I was only wondering about this Go back one slide. Yeah. What if you try k equals five? What will happen? Because before you had an example where you had d was it around twenty thousand or thirty thousand? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, twenty thousand. And, and then you have k equals hundred. Yeah. So that that ratio is presumably quite important, right? Yeah. To well. Determine how well you capture this. Yes. Process. Well. Yeah, obviously, it's problem dependent, right? But yeah. I think that, you know. The, um, well, you showed diagonal. Is that the same as k zero or something? Um, k one, I guess. No, k one. Yeah. Is the diagonal plus Wait. I mean, yeah. okay. So these these ones here. Yeah. These these are the, these are the local method, right? Is it? Yes. Because there's there will be this one where the point. Let's see. Yeah. So actually the. There are, two, there are two kinds of k's <laughs> here. So there's a one, one k in the, in the local method. It's really a low rank Langsos style k, which I've not described here. Our k actually is, is not the rank of the matrix. It's actually just the, the complexity of the parameterization. So if you, if you go back to here, you know, this is a full rank matrix, but it's got sort of you know, only yeah. you know, the, the, the degrees of freedom is, is, uh, is restricted, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. But once you square that up, it's diagonal plus low rank um, update plus some wacky arrowhead yeah. in the top left corner. That's right, yeah. And I don't know why you want the arrowhead in there. Why don't you just do that diagonal plus low rank update? We can do that. In fact, we, that's a factor analysis style uh, parameterization, and that's, that's, that's fine. The, the problem with that is it's not concave. So only... The only class that we are aware of that are concave are of this Cholesky file style. So the factor analysis one is fine. I mean, if you're happy to have a non-concave objective function, it's fine. But that's the drawback of it. 
Okay, so yeah, so that's the um, the take home message. So I I kind of you know um, I've said a lot of bad things about the local method, and which has been you know very important. And I'm not saying that you know there are the, it's totally that this is a, a replacement for it. There may indeed be some cases where the local method could actually be outperforming this variational Gaussian method, but I think that you know, it remains to be, to be demonstrated. I think from my take-home measure on this, I think a little bit is that it's tricky to, to outperform the variational Gaussian approach. Okay, are there any further questions on that one? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to point out that there's a third approach, right? You make it look like a dichotomy, but there's other approaches too. The other approach yeah. would be you can, you can apply a bound to the expectation of log psi directly. Yes. And that's been done as well. Um, and, and we yeah. found that, that I mean, we've actually prepared all three of those, and that method is almost as good as PG okay. without needing the, the quadrature. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Good points. But is never, but you never managed to find it outperforming VG or? Well, it, it never should outperform VG, right? Yeah. I mean, the bounds are going to be less yeah. by construction. Well, the the story is slightly more complicated because if you, it depends on the competition complexity you're willing to to expand, right? So it could be that there exists local procedures. If you say, um, you know, I've got a finite amount of computer resource. It could be that there's a particular problem where you can actually get a pretty good solution from the local method. Now, in principle, there exists a, a VG solution which will outperform that. But the question <coughs> is, can you find that in the same amount of CPU time? And that may not be, you know, that may not be easy to do. And uh, I haven't yet found an example of that situation, but it's not impossible that somebody could find that. Okay, so with your permission, I'll, I'll move on to part two. Just change uh, gears somewhat. Okay, so I'm going to discuss a uh, completely different topic, but it's within the deterministic inference uh, setup. So I want to talk about planning, and in uh, uh, particular using Lagrange duality. So just for those of you, I guess you're pretty familiar with the planning problem, but just to, to remind you, the idea is that an, an MDP is something like, you know, you've got a kind of uh, a state of the world. In this case, it's represented by this car. The car actually going, can go forwards or backwards, <coughs> like this and this, this valley. And basically, you've got a position and the velocity of the car. That's your state. And you can make three actions. You can either accelerate forwards, accelerate backwards, or not do acceleration at all. Okay, so the idea is that you want to try to, for whatever position and, and um, velocity you're in, you want to have a controller which says whether or not I should uh, accelerate forwards, backwards, or not do anything, such that hopefully I will get to the goal state here. And you want to do that, uh, get to there as quickly as possible. Okay, so... In terms of the setup, there are no rewards for being anywhere except for being at the goal state. You get a reward of one if you get there. So the, the mathematical setup of an, of an MDP looks like this. There are states of the world uh, S, and there are actions that you can take. And this whole thing then has got a Markovian structure to it. So your states and actions, given a particular policy, this, uh, given that you're in a policy means that if you're in a particular state, you can have a distribution of the actions that you can take. And this pi t is just a parameterization of the policy. And this then, if you're in a particular state and you take a particular action, then you go into the world says, this is how you would, what the world will be like when, you, when you're in that state and you take that particular action. So we're going to assume here that this transition is actually given to us. We know what it is from the environment. We know how this mountain car dynamics works. Um, and we want to find the best policy to get uh, to the goal as quickly as we can, okay? And the, the utility of this thing, if you have a sequence of policies for each time point, is we want to say, well, we don't, we don't know what state we will be in in the future, but we can compute the expected state that we're gonna be in, and that's gonna be the, given by this marginal distribution, P of ST and AT. And then given uh, the distribution of the state action pair that we're gonna be in, we'll have an, an associated reward with that, and then we can compute the expectation of that, and there's some over the time points in the future. And we want these policies to be such that we're going to have a high future utility, expected future utility. Okay, that's the, the basic uh, setup of MDP. And there are two things you could do. You could either say, 
we could find the optimal uh, unconstrained policies, so they each time point can have its own policy, or that's the non-stationary case, or we could constrain these policies to be the same for each time point. That's the stationary case. And the picture for these things can be described by an influence diagram, which is a bit kind of a graphical model, like a belief network, but it's uh, got some additional meaning. So these di diamonds are the utilities, so you have a utility at each time point. These uh, squares are the actions, and um, the policies basically are parameterizing the action. So given that you're in a particular state, um, what's the probability of taking an action? Okay, and that's parameterized by pi. And the, this is the non-stationary case, and this is the stationary case here. Okay, so you can probably imagine that the non-stationary case is straightforward to do. And the reason for that intuitively is that if you want to find the optimal pi sequence here, the structure of this graph looks like a, a bit like a kind of, you know, a HMM or something like that. So any kind of, you know, dynamic programming style algorithm probably would work on this. And indeed it's the case that you can then solve the optimal pi sequence here in time which is linear in the horizon, like the length of this uh, trajectory. And this gives what's called the classical Bellman recursion. Uh, well, it's the finite time, finite horizon Bellman recursion. And it works by working backwards from the end of the chain, defining beta messages. Okay, and this uh, works for any uh, time-dependent reward. And the optimal policies are actually deterministic. So you run this thing, and then what you should do is when you're in a particular state, you definitely take this action. There's not a distribution there anymore. There's only all the, all the mass is placed in, in one particular action state, action for a given state. So that's great. So the, the, so the, the non-stationary case is super easy, well understood. It's linear time. The stationary case, um, when all these pies are constrained to be the same, is much more difficult. And uh, it's also pot potentially much more useful because many problems in the real world are of that form, that you don't want necessarily to solve the problem again every time you come along with it. You want to make an, an instantaneous decision about what, given that I'm in a particular state, what action should I take now, okay? And as far as I'm aware, there are no known provably efficient solvers for this case. And I think even the complexity class is not fully understood, but it's certainly not believed to be polynomial. Um, so there are approximate solvers that you can, you can do in this case. And two relatively well-known ones are what's called policy gradients. When you parameterize the policy distribution using some exponentiated function here, and this f then is what you will learn. You'll just learn the table entries of f. Or you can use uh, something like EM. And I want to really explain how this works, but you can imagine that because this has got various sums in here, this can be related to a mixture model in some way. And you can write down an equivalent probability distribution, a transdimensional one, for which this is the normalization constant. And then you can apply EM in a classical way. Now, our experience with, uh, with both of these policy gradient and this EM style algorithms is that they're fine, but they tend to get trapped in local optima and have poor convergence properties. And indeed, you can show further that the, the convergence properties of the EM algorithm are, are, they get worse as the horizon increases. In fact, they get dramatically worse. So you can look at our papers on this if you're interested. So the point is it would be great to have an alternative uh, method. So what we're going to do is use the Lagrange duality. So I wasn't very familiar with this, so maybe I'll just give you two slide tutorials to what I understand from Lagrange duality. So the idea is to decompose uh, an objective function into a set, a master objective, into a set of what's called slave problems, slave objectives, okay? So this EX is your master objective, these ES are your slave objectives. So maybe I, it's easier to explain with an example. So imagine you've got an, an MRF, a Markov random field, and you want to find the binary x that, say, minimizes this expression. Okay, so that's, that's a tricky problem. And what you could do is, first of all, say, I'll decompose this w into w1 plus w2, this matrix. And I'll compose this vector b into two vectors, say, b1 and b2. I'll write that out like that. I just uh, then collect these, uh, this w1 and b1 together and uh, w2 and b2 t terms together. And then what I say is, well, look, you know, this looks like now a kind of a, 
an MRF problem, but on the W1B1 sort of parameter setup. And this is another MRF here. So if I call this x, x1, and this x, x2, and I didn't make any constraints that x1 should be equal to x2, I'd have two separate MRF problems to solve. And if I'd chosen these W1 and W2 to be tree structured, then I could solve the MRF and polynomial time. It would be simple, linear time effectively, right? So what kills you here is the structure of this matrix W. If it's not a uh, hypertree with a relatively low tree width, then you're, you're in trouble, right? That's really what, what kills you. But as long as you then choose these W1s and W2 sensibly, such that their sum is equal to W, then you're able, you're able to solve each slave problem uh, independently, tractably. But that's, that's great and interesting, but of course it's not the original problem. The original problem is that it's this, but you have to subject it to the constraint that x1 is equal to x2. Okay, so that's where Lagrange duality comes in. It's, it's going to relax this constraint and then solve each slave problem kind of separately in a kind of modified way, in some way which you'll, you'll adjust this modification to encourage the x1 and the x2 to be the same. So the way this works uh, mathematically is to write down a Lagrange term which encodes this penalty, this constraint that each x from your slave problem should be equal to some global x. Okay? You optimize this now with respect to, to x and this gives you this, sum, this constraint that the sum of the Lagrange multipliers is zero. You plug this back into your original Lagrangian, you end up with a new Lagrangian of this form, just because this sum here uh, over x, x, lambda s, and x is, is zero. Okay, now um, you can, given the lambda, you can solve each slave problem. So now you have a slave problem here. If you think about the MRF case, the addition of this linear term in x doesn't cause you any headache, because your headache comes from the quadratic terms, okay? So provided that adding a linear term doesn't give you any additional complexity, you can have a tractable modified slave problem here, a modified uh, yeah, slave problem. So then you can optimize for a given lambda each uh, slave problem independently. And the Lagrange dual then is defined by, if you look at this function here, for a, this totally splits up into uh, independent slave problems. Okay, and you can then maximize each independent Lagrange uh, dual independently with respect to uh, lambda s. And then what you need to do is you need to go back to your original objective and update lambda. Okay, so it's a two-stage process where given lambda, you update at the xs from each individual slave problem, then given xs, you need to update lambda. So the way you can do that is that the general theory of Lagrange duality tells you that this Lagrange dual is a convex function of lambda. So that means that any simple procedure like a gradient descent will, should hopefully do the job. You don't need to do anything too complicated there. So just gradient descent is uh, in this particular class of problems turns out just to mean that you take your original lambda and your free gradient parameter alpha, you just sub subtract off some, um, essentially the, the current sla slave solution. So in other words, it's a very, very simple updating formula for the Lagrange dual parameters. And then you need this constraint to be satisfied that these sum to zero, so you just shift the solution such that then uh, you just project the solution such that it satisfies that zero sum constraint. So that's basically the, the general high level uh, picture of Lagrange duality. So once you've got that picture in your mind, then it's kind of clear in principle what you can do for the MDP problem. You've got a, a tractable slave problem, which is the one when it's uh, non-stationary. So the idea is to relax the, um, the stationarity constraint, the non-stationarity constraint, and then uh, force them to be, or encourage them to be the same through Lagrange duality. And you know, basically, the, you can kind of figure out the details yourself. So here's the, um, here's the original objective function. This is the reward. This is the, um, this is the marginal p of s, and this is p of a given s, written in a slightly different way here. And then this term here, these are the Lagrange term, this is a Lagrange multiplier, and this is the constraint that each policy pi t should be the same as this sort of generic global policy parameter. Now, you might be wondering what this term is doing here, for those of you not to sleep yet. Um, so it's not so obvious what's going on with that, right? So why, why do we introduce this term? It turns out that if you didn't introduce this term, you do not end up with tractable slave problems. 
Okay, so this term here is introduced uh, as part of the algebra to make tractable slave problems, or at least we couldn't figure out how to make a tractable slave problem with, without it. Um, so that's the basic high-level picture. All that it means then is that we ended with a modified utility, an MDP, in which these returns are actually just modified returns. We take our original return, we just add on a little Lagrange term, and then we can solve this slave problem just in, in linear time in the horizon, so super fast. And then we just need to adjust these lambdas according to that Lagrange duality procedure, which means that we just update the lambdas by some gradient uh, based approach, which is very, very simple. And this, um, this row function here, don't worry about the details, is just how to do the projection to ensure that the lambdas sum to, to, sum to zero. Okay, so this is the algorithm. Uh, the great news is that it's uh, incredibly simple. Any MDP solver uh, for the non-stationary non case can be applied. It's uh, super fast, just a few lines of MATLAB code, and you've got uh, an MDP for the stationary case solver. And we, up, we just iterate then to convergence. So just going back to the mounting car problem, like I said, we know what the the dynamics is given for us by the, the problem, so we don't have to learn that. It's not a reinforcement learning problem. Um, but we then, we're going to assume we have a horizon of time 25. Now this problem actually is, a, is continuous space and velocity. And we've been, well, I haven't said this, but typically our, our MDP, Lagrange duality stuff at the moment, is working for discrete states and, uh, and actions. So just for simplicity, we discretize this problem into this continuous one into some discrete version of it, okay? So in that case, we have 231 discrete states, and we've got the three actions from the forwards, backwards, and do nothing. And these are the kinds of results that, that you get from this. So here is the, this is the, this, the time that we're using for CPU, okay? And what's plotted here is the, the total expected reward as we're trying to learn this policy. So in other words, you're at some some position and velocity with this car, and what, do, what should you do, what action should you take, okay? You're trying to learn that, that table, if you like. And what's plotted here, this is policy gradients with some kind of line search algorithm. So it's good, it's going up, but it's kind of, you know, converging uh, rather poorly. This purple one here is, uh, this is, e or no, it's policy gradients with a fixed step size. I don't quite know why that actually improved over doing line search, but there you go, I guess it's not impossible. Um, this red, the green one here is the EM algorithm and the, blue, the red one is the kind of EM algorithm which we switch then at the end to, um, to some kind of policy gradients algorithm to hopefully improve convergence and the blue one here is our Lagrange duality uh, approach, okay? And in fact we have another slight tweak on this which is even more ridiculously quickly convergent. Okay, so we didn't plot it because it just makes the plot look silly somehow, but um, it's very, very, very fast, okay? So you might think, okay, this is just a, just a fluke. We couldn't believe it either. Um, so here's another problem. This is the puddle world problem. And in this case, you've got uh, a grid like this, two-dimensional grid. You can go up, down, left, right by some fixed amount. And there are going to be two puddles placed uh, somewhere in the, in the environment. And your goal is to get to this area over here. And you start here. So you, you, know, you want to move in a way which avoids these puddles. And you get a, a big penalty for going in a puddle and a big reward for being in the goal. You don't get any reward for being anywhere else. But also your, your movement is slightly stochastic. So you, you, you're a little bit loose in where you're actually going to move. So you want to try to avoid getting too close even to these puddles because you may not actually be able to avoid it if you're, if you're not careful. Okay, so uh, that's the setup. Um, when you discretize this, there are 400 and something states and we're going to use a horizon of length 50. And it's a similar kind of story here with uh, a few fewer algorithms, but this is the EM algorithm again. The total expected reward is going up, but it's conver converging very slowly. This is the policy gradients algorithm in this case with the line search, which just does okay, but it kind of gets trapped in some local optima. And again, this is our Lagrange duality uh, method. And we've run this on several other problems as well and always found similar performances. So we seem to have 
uh, just a remarkably quickly convergent uh, solver. It's just beating everything out of, uh, out of the shop, basically. So in summary, solving these finite horizon and stationary policy NDPs is an interesting, yet it's a very, it's a very difficult problem math mathematically. Um, so we're using the Lagrange duality to make these tractable slave problems. Um, and the algorithm is extremely simple. It's much simpler than policy gradients or any algorithm that I'm even aware of. And it's extremely effective as well. And uh, that's it. Actually, that's the end of my talk. I'm five minutes for questions. So these uh, dual decomposition constructions are very popular for discrete MIFs as well in computer vision especially. Yeah. And um, one thing I wonder here is how do you reconstruct the primal feasible solution? You mentioned primal feasible solution yeah. and in your case it's these stochastic matrices, right? So it's very simple to just output any intermediate solution as any primal feasible solution so you can yeah. track of which one is the best according to your primal objective. Yeah. Um, but for these dual decompositions it's known that when you apply this you construct a primal relaxation and it's also known how to, um, how to return an approximate primal solution to that relaxation, which would also be interesting because it would be a mixture of, of these um, extreme points of the stochastic matrices. So it would be probably something that doesn't have a um, <coughs> zero, one elements, but fractional elements. And that's interesting as well for, for MIFs, but in your case, I think <coughs> it would be interesting to have this fractional policy of the problem you're actually solving. Yeah. How do you, I mean, what do you output? You didn't say on the slide what yeah. you output. So, uh, yeah, indeed, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of an art actually outputting a, a primal solution when you're not actually at the, at the optimum. So uh, what we do, we do two things. So what have been, the results are presented by simply taking the average of the policies. So at each time point, we have a, a policy, which is close to deterministic. Mm -hmm. uh, and sorry, no, it's, it's actually deterministic. Um, and then we take the average of all those policies through time. Uniform. Yeah. That's, that's, for example, known to converge asymptotically to the true primal relaxed solution. Is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And another thing that we do is we, we, before projection, we look at the, the Lagrange, the, we look at the objective function, the Lagrange dual, and we actually then optimize that with respect to the, the policy. So if I can explain this, let me see. Um, so, um, yeah, it's not here, but basically we, we, um, we can look at the objective function and express it in terms of the pi uh, given the current Lagrange parameters and we optimize that directly. I mean, I'm not explaining it very well. I'm a bit hazy on it's oh, a few months that we did that, but it's, it, it's in the paper. And that, that actually works better than taking the, the average. But we didn't plot the results simply because it makes the graph so ridiculously boring. I mean, it's converged within two iterations, typically. So, um, yeah. The, I think, for me, the, the thing that's not, I don't fully understand about this is that this is a mathematically difficult problem. It's, you know, there's not any sort of simple known algorithms out there which can provably work. So there's obviously something that we're exploiting here in the structure of the, the property of the, you know, the, the problem that is well suited to this Lagrange duality setup. And I don't really you know, understand why Lagrange duality is working extremely well here. There must be some thing there. Maybe it's related to the fact that the optimal solution should be deterministic or, or something. I, I, don't really, I don't really know. But that's something that if somebody's got a good idea or explanation as to why this is working well, I'd be very interested to hear it, actually. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, All right, let's yeah. thank David. Thank you.